Hello everyone. Welcome to this webinar. My name is Dimitri. I'm going to be your host for this uh, uh, one, one and a half hours that we're going to talk about uh, C++ and high performance computing. Thanks for joining us. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to mention uh, Daria, who is the uh, PMM, the Product Marketing Manager for Reshopper. She's also here with us. She might be able to uh, answer some of the questions related to, well, if you do have any questions about Reshopper. But this isn't a uh, product-specific webinar. This is a webinar where basically I want to discuss some of the uh, some of the things that are going in the high-performance computing space, uh, some of the uh, technology solutions that are there. So uh, to begin with, I, I better I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm I'm a quant. I work in quant finance. It's a discipline which is kind of like a marriage of uh, mathematics and finance and software engineering. I I program quite a bit in both C++ and .NET and MATLAB. And I also I even do a little bit of HDL programming for FPGAs. And I also mention FPGAs in in the context of our current discussion. I have been in my MVP for five years in, in the C-sharp discipline. I've done a couple of courses on Pluralsight on things like MATLAB and CUDA and D and generally high performance stuff. So uh, check those out. And uh, at JetBrains, I have the role of a technical evangelist. I'm somebody who basically talks about all the wonderful technologies and how they can improve our lives. But as I said, this webinar is mainly a uh, uh, kind of, it's not product specific, it's more technology oriented webinar and I want to talk about high performance computing. So what exactly are we going to cover? Well, uh, first of all, I want to basically talk about the technologies which are available for computation. And as I'm, I'm sure you know, the personal computer or the server isn't the only technology that you can use to actually calculate something. There are lots of different uh, different platforms, different implementations, and so on. And I'll, sh I'll show you three particular technologies apart from the uh, typical x86 architecture. I'll also uh, discuss this idea of managed versus unmanaged code, and by by managed, I mean things like uh, C Sharp and Java, things which have a virtual machine, which is supposed to be working in our benefit in terms of performance. But uh, I'm not sure that's that's exactly true. I'll I'll talk about how to leverage the capabilities of the the x86 architecture, the architecture that we've already uh, uh, become accustomed to, and I'll also talk about those uh, specialized and uh, unusual hardware solutions that exist for accelerating computation. I'll talk about what they are, uh, how to leverage them, why would you want to be working with them in the first place. So uh, I want to begin by this discussion of native versus managed code. I'm sure all of you know the distinction. So native code, the kind of code that's produced by C++ and uh, other native code programming languages such as D, for example, is when basically when source code gets turned into machine code. And the, uh, the alternative to that is managed code, something that we have in languages like C Sharp and Java. That's when source code actually gets compiled into some uh, some intermediate representation, something that looks a bit like assembly language, and subsequently this gets uh, turned into platform-specific code at the moment of execution. That that idea of JIT compilation, and it's it's a great idea in theory that you know you have your platform-neutral representation, and then off you go. And when you need to execute something, that's when things get converted. But you know it's it's a bit too ideal, a bit too good to be true for performance reasons. So managed code uh, does have its advantages. It's considered to be more portable. But then again, at the moment I'm recording this, I would argue that C++ has also become at least somewhat portable, provided you don't use any platform-specific things. And for example, in my practice, I uh, I write on Windows and I run on Linux, and I write the same code. Uh, and I, in fact, I use the same compiler. I use the Intel compiler, which exists on both Windows and Linux, and uh, and OS X as well, so it's kind of uh, it's uniform. So in that way, claiming that you know Java is the only portable language out there isn't really fair. You can write C++ that is portable. Uh, in theory, managed code when you turn it into this intermediate representation that uh, subsequently gets JIT compiled. In theory, that process of JIT compilation optimizes the code for various platforms, but in practice, the optimizations are well. I'm not 
I'm generally not a believer in uh, optimizing compilers in the sense that they can take every situation and make it perfect. I think they can make the most obvious situations perfect. The most obvious parallelizable loop can in fact be parallelized, but in the general case I, I believe in having the power to fine tune this myself. Uh, managed code, generally, if we look at it today, it does not permit any kind of low-level interaction with the process. I think we're only now seeing the uh, .NET uh, JIT compiler, uh, including uh, including SIMD support, and I think that's only happening in some uh, in some preview version of the JIT. So uh, we're not there yet. Of course, uh, managed code gives you additional safety. You know, things like array bound checks and various type conversion checks. But then, of course, after this, we end up with languages such as D, which are configurable in the sense that, for example, in the D programming language, you can choose whether or not you get array bound checks. You can turn them off entirely or you can turn them off for specific types of functions and it's a lot more flexible that way because with the with languages such as C Sharp and Java sometimes you don't really control uh, whether this happens or not. So uh, in addition, managed code isn't actually as portable as you'd like it to be. So just because .NET, just because Roslyn went uh, open source and is now available on the web, that doesn't mean that all the libraries suddenly became totally portable and available. So things like the user interface, this idea that uh, you know the .NET doesn't have a uh, uh, kind of uh, canonical, shall we say, cross-platform UI implementation or uh, libraries like WCF, they're not really everywhere. Therefore, it's kind of, uh, you cannot claim total portability. And the state of this uh, portability keep, keeps changing because sometimes Mono, for example, catches up to things and sometimes it kind of loses the, uh, loses, uh, loses out again. I think things are going to be a bit different now that C Sharp itself is open source, so I'm hoping for the best, obviously. Uh, managed code uh, typically uh, went with the, uh, at least C Sharp and Java, they went with this idea of garbage collection, which I guess for performance reasons, uh, sometimes you might want to uh, get rid of. And also, we, we're now seeing uh, languages such as D. I keep bringing up D as an example. It's a good example of the fact that you can have a language where uh, garbage collection is available, but if you don't want it, you can switch it off for particular constructs. It's a lot more uh, It's a lot more flexible that way. And one thing about garbage collection, I'll say, is that uh, diagnosticity is a lot better because essentially, if you don't know when an object gets disposed, then you're going to be using a uh, going to be using a tracing application to figure out when exactly the object went out of scope and who held that reference and so on. So you, you, it's simply different problems on different platforms. And of course, uh, it, it's great to be able to interact. So if you want to use uh, C++ and uh, native code for the performance critical bits, you can always, you can always interact with it from Java or from uh, .NET. I'm not a, a great expert on Java interop, but I can say that on the .NET platform, interoperability is generally great, especially if all you need is uh, functions ex being exported from dynamic libraries uh, written in C++. In that in that regard, you know, uh, C Sharp is uh, makes it, makes the consumption of this code really easy. So uh, one thing that uh, that is always a problem and uh, uh, our company is, in fact, uh, in this game of productivity. And the question here is, well, if you're advocating C++, what kind of productivity gains or losses are we actually experiencing? Because uh, I think we have to make a distinction between developer productivity and uh, the productivity of so software. So we do want our code to run as quickly as possible, but we also want the developers to uh, uh, to be able to write that code and to maintain it. And I think in C++, the, the place where C++ loses out and uh, even taking into account the modern C++ variety, I think the, the place where it loses out is the initial level of challenge. The fact that, you know, if you're starting out in C++, it's a lot more difficult to just get something done than in managed languages. But uh, so so we have this, this understanding that managed languages are somehow e simpler to use. Uh, historically, they've had better coding assistance, but uh, as you probably know, we are working at JetBrains to redress the balance, so we're making a C++ IDE, and we're also adding C++ support to ReSharper. So those two things are 
going to maybe shift the focus uh, slightly back to C++. And it, it's kind of, it's made to coincide with the fact that C++ itself has, startly, uh, has uh, started evolving because for about, I don't know, 13 years since C++ 98 until C++ 11, there's been this huge area of stagnation. Basically, nothing was happening in C++. And so I'm hoping that uh, we'll, play, uh, we'll play some sort of role in that as well. Now, this talk is mainly focused on uh, CPU bound problems, meaning that you're not getting enough, uh, you're not getting enough uh, processing speed, uh, you're not getting your task executed correctly. But some of the problems, and it's important to notice that some of the problems uh, actually bottleneck on the I/O aspect. And the typical example of that is compilation speed. That's a problem that's been worrying me for since forever, I think, especially in the C++ space, because as you know, we have some compilers which are extremely fast, like the D compiler is, you know, it's almost instant, you, you press F6 and everything has been compiled already. And then we have compilers which are kind of tolerable, like .NET and Java compilers, you can, you can generally live with the, the amount of time that it takes to compile something. And then, of course, on the extreme scale, we have C++ and Scala, which are very slow. I mean, I use a cluster build system, I use Incredible to compile C++, because for large projects, you know, this is uh, the only way that you can escape atrociously long compilation speed. So the, the point here is that uh, some problems are in fact I.O. bound and uh, when you swap out a typical hard drive by an SSD and you compile those applications, uh, uh, it becomes a lot faster. So the, the solution here is uh, we're going to be talking about optimizing obviously the processes, but in terms of optimizing the, uh, the I.O. mechanism. There, there are options here as well. There's obviously RAID and fast SSDs and maybe Fusion I.O. if you can afford it. Uh, I have uh, an approach where I build these uh, kind of virtual labs. You take lots of tiny small SSDs, they're cheap actually, and you put them into a, uh, a virtual machine kind of a hypervisor that looks after them. So each SSD has a separate uh, virtual operating system and then everything performs your your parallel compilation or testing or whatever, that's a, uh, that's a paradigm that works for me and it's actually cost effective. And of course we have RAM disk and recently I was actually, uh, I was, uh, some colleague asked me, uh, is RAM disk still relevant? And I, I told them, no, SSDs came along and, and we no longer have to worry about any of this stuff. But he said, well, check it again. So I went back to my computer and I made a, made a RAM disk, just a tiny one, and I checked it again and RAM disk is still faster than SSDs, at least for compilation purposes. Of course, you can no longer buy a hardware RAM disk that sits on the PCI bus and having, uh, having a RAM disk on your main memory requires lots of RAM, which in turn requires, you know, ECC RAM on server boards and Xeons and it becomes very expensive. So I don't know how I don't know how realistic that advice is, but at least when I see people not using SSDs, I begin to worry because they're, they're obviously losing some of the performance. But that's not what this talk is about. So uh, I'm going to talk about some of the things that affect processes specifically, like parallelization, for example, because, I mean, we're at this weird stage in our history where we cannot really expect CPU clock speeds to suddenly pick up. We're not going to see 100 gigahertz processors. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe uh, maybe we'll have, I don't know, graphene-based processors or some, some scientific breakthrough might come along. But as it stands right now, and that, as it's been for the last, I don't know, five years, we, we can't expect uh, we can't expect higher clock speeds, nor can we expect the number of cores to rise significantly. Do you remember all those promises when Intel was saying you're going to have 80 core processes soon? Well, <laughs> it's not it's not happening. I'm I'm not seeing it happen. Well, what we we do have like six core processes, and yeah, if you're lucky, you can have a 32 core processor. I think I have some of those, but but they're stupidly expensive, and you know, for the most part, I think if you find somebody with a laptop uh, or, or even a desktop, they they are likely to to have a quad core and that's it. That's that's pretty much our limitation. And also we cannot expect the number of CPU sockets per motherboard to increase. I think there might be uh, there might be technological limitations, but I suspect 
and I have no proof, of course, but I suspect the manufacturers are just too greedy. Nobody's going to make a motherboard where you can arbitrarily plug in, uh, plug in new uh, processors. I cannot go out and you know buy a new Xeon and stick it because there's nowhere to put it into. So unfortunately, the conclusion we can draw from this, like the, the overall conclusion, is that the PC and server architectures they do not scale. You you cannot you cannot buy new stuff and stick it into your machine and make it faster because you've already taken up all the all the memory slots all the CPU slots and whatever. So the only way to really accelerate computation is to somehow increase that number of entities to compute on. And by entities, I mean absolutely anything. So an entity can be the amount of data that you process per a single instruction. It can be the number of cores, of course, or the number of processes. And the, the sort of worst case scenario is that you simply buy another machine. And that's one of the things that personally I've been trying to avoid as much as I can because, I mean, certainly you can buy lots and lots of computers, but uh, when you buy a new computer, not only do you pay the cost of a processor, that would be fine, but you also pay for the power supply, the motherboard, the memory, you pay for everything basically. So it's not very cost efficient, uh, although that's the that's the model, that's what people do right now, a computer cluster right now, as uh, as people understand it, is you know, lots of machines joined up together uh, in some sort of network. So, uh, so let's talk about parallelization. Now, uh, before we do, it's important to ask us uh, ask ourselves the question like is it still relevant because I mean given the fact that we're not seeing an explosion in the number of cores why should we really care but even having I don't know a quad core or something is already pretty good and some some of the parallelization things I'll mention aren't even related to cores so the first one for example the instruction level parallelism this is the idea that on the CPU you have um, you have a uh, set of very large registers, so a register that's larger than the typical word size, and then you have instructions which operate in them. So, for example, you can have an instruction which, instead of adding uh, like two floating point values together, it takes four pairs of those values and uh, is adds them up in a single instruction. And this approach is called SIMD, Single Instruction Multiple Data. And you might recognize some of the acronyms like MMX and SSE and AVX. These things have been around for years and they they provide a certain amount of speed up because I mean after all if you if you can add four uh, floating point values instead of just four pairs instead of just one pair that's great that's a uh, that's effectively a fairly significant uh, increase in speed so uh, we can actually if we're using C++ and not Java and not uh, C sharp then we can leverage these things we can uh, use uh, different mechanisms we can write assembly language and stick it right into C++ we can use intrinsics or oh, finally we can hope for the compiler to do this for, for us automatically so uh, apart from that uh, we we come to the the classical approaches like using uh, separate threads. So if you have n logical cores or n hardware threads, then simply make as many software threads, and then you you sort of hope for the operating system to schedule them equally so that they they get placed in the right uh, in the right location. And uh, when constructing new threads, I know there is always an API for making new threads, but it's also possible to make new threads declaratively. So in C++, the OpenMP technology, for example, you simply put a pragma in front of the loop, and that's it. It kind of, it parallelizes things uh, by itself, and this is one of the places where I actually trust the compiler. I trust the compiler to parallelize things, at least on the simpler loops, shall we say. And then, of course, at the higher level, we have sort of machine-level parallelization, where you basically you build a cluster of machines, they get they get to communicate through some sort of uh, some sort of interconnect, and uh, uh, that that option is always on the table. Maybe not the most cost efficient. So I uh, just wanted to mention SIMD briefly as a technology that uh, uh, that's available for leveraging those uh, those larger instructions. Because I mean, I have serious doubts that a JIT compiler from Java or C sharp would leverage this automatically in the correct way. But in C plus plus, you can kind of get to it directly. So you can write inline assembly, you can write ASM blocks right inside your C++ code that do this, or you can do it via so-called intrinsics. And these are essentially C++ functions, but uh, they get turned into effectively SIMD instructions. But of course, there is there is a certain amount of tax when you leverage these because you have to 
have to use special data types. You have to, for example, if your SIM register is one, 128 bits, you have to use a special data type. And so you cannot use operators. You cannot write A times B, unfortunately, which can be a problem because, I mean, I, I'm used to writing A times B when I mean A times B. I don't want to write MMOPSA, B, although uh, there is no there is no way around it. So um, uh, an alternative, again, is compiler vectorization. That's when you basically trust the compiler to uh, to sort of leverage SIM automatically in the loop, for example. And it should work in the simplest of cases. But I think that on critical paths, you, you really want to handcraft this stuff. And of course, as, as an extra option, there are actually uh, special compilers or compiler extensions like Intel SPMD, which actually provide language extensions specifically for leveraging SIM. And the, it's kind of an admission of the fact that the default constructs in C++ might not be the most user-friendly. One thing I want to point out here, though, is that uh, it's all well and good discussing SIM, but you have to remember that some of the, uh, some of the, uh, uh, how should I put it? Uh, the SIM instructions are evolving. Uh, each of the new, uh, each of the new constructs, uh, each of the new processes is essentially introducing more and more uh, instructions. They're introducing wider registers. And so the, uh, the consequence of that is that you may end up writing C++ code that simply isn't going to run on some of these machines because they don't have support for the particular instructions that you've used. So this is, uh, this is uh, an interesting kind of slant on portability because suddenly you know, you, you're targeting particular processes. And in certain cases, this approach is completely valid. And specifically, if we're talking about high performance computing, then one of the assumptions, uh, at least one of the assumptions I'm making is that the code I'm writing is going to run on my hardware. And I, I know my hardware. I know the level of uh, streaming SIMD extension support that is going to be on my process. So I can write uh, anything I want. And it's the same with a, uh, let's say you're using a hosted solution where all the servers are identical. You know what the servers are, so you can leverage that particular, uh, that particular level of uh, SIM. And, and it's great. Um, so I want to just, just briefly show how this looks in practice. Let me uh, uh, bring up Visual Studio. Uh, Hopefully, all of you can see this. So what I have on the screen is a function which uh, takes a pointer to a set of bytes from an image, and it turns it from a color image to a black and white image. But instead of using the, um, instead of using the uh, ordinary, ordinary loops and whatever, it's using, it's using SIM. So you can see the M128 types here. So uh, what, why is this, uh, why is this, uh, Good demonstration. Well, you can see some of the uh, some of the problems. Like, for example, you want to initialize a 128-bit register, so you have to have a an intrinsic for that. And then you want to uh, when you want to uh, address memory that references uh, references the uh, the elements four elements at a time, then you have to sort of do a pointer cast. I think Bishop is actually reminding me I can use interpret cast here, but it doesn't matter. And subsequently, uh, there is a lot of uh, kind of pointer manipulation going on because essentially the uh, C++ itself is not attuned, shall we say, to working with these kinds of registers. So effectively, this M128 construct is just a uh, uh, a union, and that's a union that you can address in, in various different ways. So. Um, it's just a small illustration of how this looks in practice, and you can see that it's not very readable, but it does provide certain performance advantages. And ultimately, the uh, ultimately that's that's one. It's it's not the only approach to leveraging SIM, but uh, it's it's one of the approaches to actually uh, work with it as as closely as possible without writing inline assembly, which it's a, uh, which is another possibility as well. So. Um, Moving past SIM, so uh, what what we look at with SIM is called instruction level parallelism. So a single instruction works on several elements of data. The next option is obviously data level parallelism, and the idea is that you know you've got an array of data and you have to you want to process every element in roughly the same fashion. How do you do it? So the kind of map reduce and similar concerns. How how can these be addressed? And the way I do it is with OpenMP. OpenMP is a declarative rather than imperative mechanism for parallelizing things. And uh, 
simply simply put, if you have like a for loop, for example, you can put the following pragma right in front of the for loop. You can write hash pragma OMP parallel four, and this will attempt to automatically, or should I say, automatically, parallelize the loop, uh, provided that of course it's not uh, interdependent in any way. There are no blocking conditions there, and so on. And this uh, this syntax for parallelizing loops, I have a simple uh, a simple illustration here, but it can be are more complicated and uh, there are lots of options. And OpenMP is generally a very mature technology uh, if you want to leverage it. And you can mix it with SIMD. I think I've actually done this, uh, if you look here, uh, right at the top, um, here it is. So this line, not only am I leveraging SIMD, but I am also attempting to parallelize the whole loop so that each line of the image that we're trying to convert gets uh, gets converted in a on a separate core effectively. So uh, that's another advantage, and of course uh, you can you can do things in a imperative fashion. So work, working with threads directly or using a library like, for example, Intel threading building blocks or the the Microsoft Parallel Patterns library. They actually have a more or less compatible interface. I think the, uh, the Intel library has a few more constructs. So. Um, uh, in, in this case, there are functions like parallel for parallel for each. If you're a .NET developer, you should recognize some of this stuff because in, in .NET, for example, I don't know about Java, but in .NET, we, we, we do have this kind of blind parallelism that instead of writing a for loop, you can write parallel dot four and uh, you know have it have it done automatically. Um, and there are collections which kind of play nice with the idea of uh, parallels, meaning that they play nice with uh, being able to access the collections from separate threads, should you need to. Um, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of specialized hardware. You can see some of the images here on the screen because ultimately we are, uh, I mean, I have a personal, personal computer under my desk and we're very constrained. There, it's very difficult to expand anywhere. I can certainly keep upgrading my uh, machine until I've spent all my money on the fastest Xeons and, uh, uh, you know, spend lots of time that way. But uh, I, I like I like expensive toys and I, I think that uh, there are cases when they, they're actually relevant. So um, I'm going to mention only the three technologies shown here on the right. I think uh, there, there are lots of other ones that are even more specialized, shall we say, lots of specialized solutions. Uh, uh, dedicated to different industries, but what I want to talk about is the more general purpose, uh, general purpose hardware. So first of all, the uh, piece of hardware that you all probably know is uh, uh, GPGPU graphics cards. Basically, they used to be just for graphics, but now we kind of uh, we leverage them for a general purpose computation. Thus, the acronym GPGPU. But the problem with GPUs, I mean, they can uh, they're highly parallel and they're excellent at computation, whether it's graphical or just you know mathematics. I, we're no longer constrained by uh, the ideas of uh, using just the graphical applications, but the problem with GPUs is ultimately that they're actually not general enough. So I cannot run, uh, I cannot use boost libraries, I cannot use the SDL on uh, on, uh, on a graphics card. Uh, they're, they're okay for data parallel mathematics, so things like plus minus sine cos, that sort of thing, but you cannot write uh, general code on them, and you need something else. So another option is uh, well, different expansion boards, essentially. But all of these are expansion boards, but some of them are specifically kind of computation-related. So um, the idea is always the same. You have a computer inside a computer. Uh, that's the only way you're going to uh, expand horizontally. I guess that's the right term, plugging computers into your computer. So uh, the most well-known example is the Intel Xeon Pi. That's essentially a coprocessor that you can uh, plug into your machine, and it's kind of like, well, it's it's plugging a computer inside a computer. And finally, the last thing I want to mention is uh, custom chips. So uh, things like uh, FPGAs or ASICs that are also used in certain industries, shall we say. And uh, in the quant finance industry, we use FPGAs for some of the tasks. But generally, this is uh, the danger zone, shall we say, because th these things are uh, they're more uh, well. They're more expensive both to buy and to program, and also they're you know they they require a change in the mindset. They behave differently, so it's uh, uh, it it does require specialized skills. But I'll mention FPGAs as well. 
So GPGP is probably the the most accessible technology because uh, it's uh, it's it's been made accessible by companies which actually manufacture the hardware and they've realized that not only is this for gaming but we can let people actually program uh, program things. So essentially the, the hardware platforms, the two most popular platforms for doing any kind of accelerated uh, C++ development are uh, NVIDIA and ATI and subsequently we have software platforms uh, which are, well I'm going to mainly talk about CUDA but there's also OpenCL and C++ apps. So if you are into NVIDIA's uh, hardware then CUDA is, uh, well CUDA is in my opinion the most successful uh, GPU related technology. I wouldn't claim that it, because it doesn't try to cover other devices, but on the GPU, I would say CUDA is the most polished and the most kind of uh, accessible. Uh, uh, I see a question here, actually. Somebody is asking whether ReSharper uh, has uh, support for CUDA. I actually asked the guys uh, to uh, to make sure that CUDA is supported. I, I'm hoping that CUDA will be supported because there isn't really that much to support. There's only one language extension there, so I think I think they're going to make it. But I'm not making any promises. But I think this should definitely uh, definitely be done at some point. Uh, then there is OpenCL, and uh, the thing about OpenCL is, well, I, I'm not such a big fan. But the great thing about OpenCL is that it targets all the platforms. It tries to target absolutely everything, including. FPGAs, although unfortunately I think FPGA development boards for, with OpenCL support are not exactly cheap right now, but uh, that's likely to change. And then there is uh, Microsoft, and what they came up with is a library called C++ AMP, which is an attempt to make a universal API for both AMD and NVIDIA graphics accelerators. But at the moment, it's kind of it's Windows only. It's fairly constrained. I'm I'm hoping that maybe other compiler uh, compiler manufacturers would implement the standard, but uh, no guarantee of that. So um, I, I, I'll just show CUDA in my demo. Uh, one thing about all of these devices, not just uh, not just GPUs, is uh, how m the question of how many devices can you plug in? Because remember, I just claimed that that we have horizontal scaling, uh, and the reason why uh, the reason why we have uh, horizontal scaling is because there's more than one PCI slot on the motherboard. So theoretically, you can plug in more than one device. The typical number is two, however. In GPUs, people generally see a, a drop off in effectiveness after that. But I think this actually needs to be verified. I, I'm working on uh, machines where every machine has two, two GPUs or two Xeon Phi's. But I, I, I think that uh, uh, the, there are other limitations there. Like, for example, uh, is the power supply uh, enough to power all these devices and uh, those sorts of things. But sometimes, yeah, you, 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 do get, uh, you do get limitations in terms of computability as well because you do get PCI bus congestion. It, it depends on your usage pattern. If you're sending lots of data to and from, then, uh, then you know, that's, the, uh, that's one situation. If you're sending off lots of data and then you're waiting for like an hour for it to compute, then it's not a problem if you have more than two devices. Although, once again, as I said, there, are, there might be other natural limitations related to just system design. Uh, there is a question here as to why I'm not a fan of OpenCL. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a fan of OpenCL for GPUs specifically. I think OpenCL as an idea is generally great. The problem is that for GPUs it does get a bit verbose because uh, programming G, uh, programming OpenCL is a bit like programming CUDA but programming it in the uh, uh, in the device API rather than the uh, kind of end user API, so it does become a bit more verbose. I think that OpenCL is generally a fantastic idea. The fact that we're seeing a, a major uptake of uh, uh, OpenCL for FPGAs means that essentially you can write a program, you can write an OpenCL program, and then you can run it on a Xeon file or you can run it on an FPGA, and that's, that's a fantastic idea. For some reason, uh, though, the uh, at least uh, in, in my experience, the tool set for GPU specifically on uh, from NVIDIA is so great that I, I simply, you know, I love it and I'm going to show some of it uh, during this presentation actually. Um, oh yeah, I have a slide on CUDA versus OpenCL. So uh, the way I see it, CUDA is kind of like the, the main commercially successful GPU platform. OpenCL is still present there and uh, it does have its uses, but the evidence I'm looking at, why, why am I making this strange claim, it's because if, if we look at who supports CUDA, then we see that programs like Photoshop and MATLAB and all sorts of other major 
manufacturers, they go off and they support CUDA first of all. And some of them, yes, yeah, some of them go off and support OpenCL as well, but typically it's the second choice. So first of all, uh, it's CUDA support, and then if there is time, uh, we'll do support for uh, OpenCL in that regard. I'm not saying that's a, an indicator of technology's worth. I'm saying it's an industry trend and an indicator of success of the technology. Um, in many in many domains, especially uh, surprisingly enough, domains which uh, which should be leveraging GPU to the maximum. In many domains, we're seeing the situation where uh, GPU isn't being leveraged well, and video transcoding is you know you should uh, Google this article: the sad state of GPU video transcoding because essentially, even though we have this technology, people aren't leveraging it uh, well enough. Um, uh, there's a question here about the cloud and the fact that Amazon provides high-performance nodes. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, ca you can rent GPU nodes. I think they're actually NVIDIA ones. And, um, and so the, uh, in, in that regard, yeah, you don't have to buy your own GPUs. In fact, if you look at the design of something like CUDA, you will see that it's, uh, for development purposes, it's a client-server platform, meaning that your GPUs can be stored somewhere far, far away and uh, the developer doesn't really need direct access to the GPU, but uh, but you know it's at some point uh, well uh, it's it, it's been made very convenient for us, shall we say? I, I I keep waiting for the slide where I actually get to show off the the uh, the way the development is done. So in terms of performance, though, and and this is this is very subjective, I guess, but it's generally assumed that CUDA is better at floating point and AMD is better at integral math. At some point during the uh, the Bitcoin craze, uh, ATI or AMD devices were preferred to CUDA for mining Bitcoins. And the reason was that one of the uh, fixed point instructions was twice as fast as CUDA. So that's, uh, that's uh, the, the perception of some people, but I think you have to, you have to basically verify this for your, your particular applications because, I mean, it depends on what exactly you're doing. So um, CUDA then. Uh, one big surprise that uh, might come to <laughs> uh, developers, especially coming from uh, C Sharp and Java, is that CUDA is actually managed technology. So it's it's not as native code as you speak, because essentially uh, you do write uh, programs in languages such as C. Well, C, CUDA C is kind of the main language. You can also use others, of course. And But they get compiled into an intermediate representation, so kind of like C Sharp getting compiled into IL. This gets compiled into something called PDX. And then the graphics driver kind of decompiles it into something that's uh, device-specific and executable on the device. And, and this allows CUDA to support uh, different uh, well, it allows CUDA to support different devices, and it also permits CUDA to support different programming languages, such as Python, because if, if you want your language to support CUDA, you just have to transcompile to this PDX format, and the rest uh, the rest of the problem is kind of uh, taken care of. So uh, CUDA, I mean, uh, you might, the above, what I just said, might, might look like a claim that CUDA is not device independent, but like CUDA is device independent, but it, it really isn't so much because device capabilities, they keep changing, and so you, you keep having to adapt to uh, new devices. There is, no, uh, there is no swap, for example, so how do you know how much memory to allocate? You allocate too much because you're working with a modern device, and then somebody runs it on a really, uh, really old, terrible graphics card with uh, no capabilities that you're after, and you have a problem. So this is why I love being able to work with hardware of the, whose capabilities I know rather than, you know, what games uh, manufacturers have to do because if you're writing a game for the general market, you have to adapt to, like, a zillion uh, different devices. So CUDA C is the primary development language for CUDA, and uh, CUDA actually uses something called the compiler driver. It takes your sources, which can, can be, you know, ordinary C++, and it rips it into two parts. So the part that's... Uh, done for the CPU gets compiled on the CPU, and the part that's uh, uh, for the GPU gets compiled by CUDA, and then those two are glued together, and uh, everything's kind of uh, taken care of automatically. Um, I really want to show uh, a demo of uh, what CUDA is like, so let me, uh, let me open up uh, Visual Studio. So yes, the uh, ANSI toolkit, that's what allows development for CUDA. It integrates into Visual Studio and you get all sorts of wonderful uh, debugging support and whatever. So this is an application which actually um, 
just adds to arrays together. It's a bit verbose. I think CUDA 6 is making uh, working with memory a bit easier in this regard. But essentially what we're doing, if we ignore all these checks, is we're taking two arrays of numbers and we're adding them up together on a graphics device. So uh, the way it works, as I said, you have a single, uh, a single source code file, but that file gets ripped into two pieces. So everything that's decorated with indicators such as global or device, uh, the, the compiler driver knows that they relate to the GPU, so it rips them out, it, it compiles them for, uh, it turns them into PTX, whatever. The rest gets passed to an ordinary C++ compiler. So the question is, well, how do we know, uh, how do we glue the pieces together? And the answer is, well, there is a language extension here. So um, the language extension is, uh, let's see if I can find it. Where is it? Come on. Control F, less, 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 no, less, less, less. Yeah, here it is. All right, so this is uh, probably the only extension to the language, the triple angle chevrons. That's basically a point of invocation of the so-called kernel. So this is a call from a, the CPU to the GPU. That's basically all we need to effectively leverage the, uh, leverage the device. So um, at this point, we're calling something on the GPU, the kernel called add kernel. And uh, this, this part executes on the GPU. And we can actually debug on the GPU. I can actually literally put a breakpoint on the GPU and press a start to the debugging button. And I'm in a breakpoint on the GPU. I can sort of look at the uh, uh, look at the variables, look at the thread ID. It's also possible to um, kind of walk around different threads. Because remember, it's a highly parallel setting. And we might want to examine a particular thread. And there are tools for. Uh, this sort of thing. There is could a debug focus. I can say that I want to be on thread number one, for example. And I press OK, and now I'm, I'm in a different thread. So I have thread index equal to one. So uh, all the tools for debugging and figuring out what's going on there, there, and and you can you can leverage them. And it just makes. I mean, I once again, I don't know much about OpenCL. I've looked at it at some point, but uh, leveraging CUDA at least, you know, I'm I'm running this on a, on a a uh, very uh, uh, very early stage uh, uh, CUDA device and leveraging it is fairly easy and and it and it's great you know the toolkit is fantastic you can just uh, uh, obviously there is a certain paradigm shift because uh, you have to uh, you have to uh, prepare your data you have to s send it off to the device you have to specifically allocate things and if you have more than one device then you have to spawn threads and whatever so the the programming paradigm is different but uh, Ultimately, uh, you know, leveraging uh, leveraging graphics capabilities has never been easier. Though I think it could be a lot easier still. So, um, just as a bird's eye view of uh, what CUDA is, uh, uh, so uh, the the architecture, shall we say, and the architecture is actually similar uh, on AMD and uh, CUDA devices. I I just use CUDA's terminology. So you have a set of uh, so-called streaming multiprocessors on the device. You can certainly have more than one. And then each of these multiprocessors has a set of uh, uh, processes, also known as CUDA cores. And then we can launch a huge number of threads in parallel to be executed on those uh, on those devices. And so computation is data parallel. And one of the constraints, a really unfortunate constraint, I think, is that each thread that you schedule on the device has to execute the same instruction. That's what's called a SIMT architecture as opposed to SIMD that we had previously. So in reality, uh, you can try splitting your execution model. You can sort of uh, stream things onto the device and uh, do, do separate things. But what it doesn't allow you to do is it doesn't allow you to do too much branching. Um, so this very large uh, number of streaming processes basically makes sure that even though the clock speed of a GPU is lower, the, their ultimate, the fact that there are so many of them, the GPU wins out over CPU. Of course, it only wins out for problems which are immediately parallelizable. I hope that's, uh, uh, that's fairly obvious. Um, and let's not forget the fact that you can use both CPU and GPU simultaneously, simply you know connecting the, the two together when you need to pick up the the result of the data that's been processed. So I think we already uh, we already did some kind of demo. Uh, I better 
uh, run along. So the first limitation of CUDA is that it doesn't support an ordinary x86. You cannot run STL or Boost or whatever your favorite library is. Uh, it's mainly usable for data parallel math, so things like plus, minus, sine, cos. There are a few functions uh, supported in there, but uh, it would be really problematic to build, you know, complicated object-oriented systems and run them in CUDA. That's not something that people do. So ordinary codes isn't going to run on the GPU. Um, next problem is that running several tasks on the GPU is generally difficult. Uh, lots of different uh, running lots of different uh, processes is uh, well, it's kind of not CUDA's game, shall we say. So if you want to simulate a card game where the outcomes of uh, Monte Carlo simulation are different, then CUDA is not your not the right uh, place to do it. And the reason for that is a problem called branch divergence. That's what I mentioned, that each of the threads wants to run uh, the same thing. Each of the threads wants to run a, a, the same instruction at the same time. So if you have a branching code on some of the threads, then effectively your parallel computation turns serial, it turns sequential, which is really annoying because, uh, well, it's, it's a waste of uh, processing resources. So um, given these limitations, there, there must be something else that you can use if you don't want data parallel math. And uh, we have other coprocessor types to help us take care of this. So uh, the, the, problem is, uh, the problem is always the same. Uh, we, uh, we want to plug a computer into our computer and we cannot plug in new CPUs, so what can we do? Well, uh, the, the alternative is to put some side of coprocessor, some kind of coprocessor on the PCI bus. And, and a GPU is... Uh, is certainly a, um, a CPU is certainly a coprocessor, but there are other ones which are more flexible, shall we say. So, uh, but but the, the the pattern of interaction is going to stay the same. You're sending some data to that other inner machine, and you're getting some data uh, from that machine. Uh, and this is uh, this is somewhat scalable. So the the device I want to talk about is uh, the Intel Xeon Phi. Essentially, it's a uh, Maybe the most uh, the most uh, well known uh, commercial coprocessor implementation. It's made by Intel. It's essentially a PCI board with uh, 60 cores. They're slow cores, just just so you know. They're uh, they're like uh, Pentium 4 class cores, I think. But the the key thing about this, there are two key things about this. The first key thing is that these cores can run entirely separate, independent tasks. That means you don't have that GPU constraint anymore. You don't have to do data parallel math. You can do uh, parallel anything effectively. But the key thing is that this thing supports x86. You can't have your cake and eat it. You can't have boost and whatever. But it still it does still require a recompile. But once you recompile, you, uh, certain libraries have already been recompiled for you, by the way, by Intel themselves. Once you recompile, you can run your stuff on this card. And there are different ways of actually leveraging the, uh, leveraging the parallelism, given that there are 60 cores there. So you can use OpenMP. You can use MPI. You can use Silk Plus, which is Intel's own, uh, Intel's own proprietary technology. You can use ordinary threading, you know, pthreads if you're on Linux, or threading building blocks. Uh, some of the external libraries provided by Intel already leverage Xeon Phi, so that's that's another benefit. And this is a computer, so it, it's not just you know something that comes with a driver like a graphics card. This is a computer; it runs its own instance of Linux. You can SSH to it and so on. And uh, there are different ways of interacting with this beast. So one of the ways is you know running it independently as a separate machine, and another way is offloading some data to that to that device. So um, you do, uh, as I said, you do need to recompile. You do need uh, special development tools for this, specifically the Intel C++ compiler. I, I, I have to confess that I only use the Intel C++ compiler. I don't use the Microsoft Visual C++ compiler or whatever. I think the Intel compiler has a critical advantage, which means, uh, and this advantage is that it exists on both Windows and Linux, the fact that you know you're developing, uh, you can develop on Windows and then uh, run something on Linux, and it's kind of, uh, uh, it's kind of in equivalent in a way, so that's helpful. So. Uh, Intel also makes lots of tools for C++ developers, not just the compiler, but libraries, profilers, and so on. Uh, it, does, it does also come with Visual Studio integration, as you may have guessed. Uh, Visual Studio integration is a key thing for me. I love Visual Studio. Uh, so to work with Xeon Phi, you basically need this compiler. You also need a special, uh, special technology stack, I guess, for interacting with it, and you need lots of patience as you figure out this paradigm, because it's somewhat different to, uh, to what you might be used to. So. Um, 
the mechanics of interaction with this device are uh, that there are three different paradigms for interaction. So you can offload things to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, device. So you, you launch your application on the host, but then uh, if you've got extra work that would benefit from uh, running on Xeon Phi, you offload that extra work. And there are custom directives to take care of that. Uh, then there is the native execution mode. That's basically when you treat the whole thing as a separate machine. And uh, you, you can sort of, you can, uh, you can have the same, same application that you compile for both the uh, both the native, shall we say, uh, side as well as the Phi side, and the symmetric execution as well. So if you if you think of a Phi as simply an element in your uh, in your computer cluster, something you would control with MPI or a similar technology, then uh, you can have Phi participate in that, and there is no problem as well. So it's a very flexible device in terms of uh, in terms of uh, general you know execution depending on uh, depending on how you want to actually leverage it so I want to give you a brief uh, demo of uh, the Xeon Phi uh, bear with me as I fire this up this might take a while uh, meanwhile let me answer some of the questions or at least try to so uh, CUDA has to copy data to the devices. Of which magnitude of data do we gain something from CUDA? Well, one of the problems with CUDA is, yeah, it's, it, does, it does take time to send data to and from, which means that if you want to uh, use, uh, well, this basically means that for an application like, I don't know, high frequency trading, for example, CUDA is not the best option because that time for sending data is, is still fairly significant. So uh, if, you, if you want, you know, sort of uh, microsecond responses and whatever, then uh, that's, going to be, uh, that's going to be a problem. But if you have, uh, a, uh, if you have no uh, significant timing requirements and you simply have uh, uh, computation requirements that, you know, your calculation takes too much time, that's when you leverage things. So if you have, uh, well, let me give you an example, uh, kind of real life example. Uh, the Moscow exchange here in Russia, uh, it gives me about eight gigabytes a day of data. All the, the whole transaction log is about eight gigabytes a day. It can be more on particularly active days. And you want to process this all somehow in meaningful time. And you can certainly do it on the, uh, uh, you can certainly do it on the, uh, uh, the ordinary, um, uh, the ordinary machines, it, it will just take a ridiculous amount of time. So that's when you leverage the GPU. As for instant responses, so to speak, that's when you leverage something like FPGA technologies and, and uh, similar things. Uh, seems like uh, the, the rule of presentations is uh, very much active here. Let me, uh, oh wait, wait, wait. No, we're, we're on a device that has two Xeon Phi cards plugged in. Let's try doing something. Uh, I think I have something in the Phi directory that I can show. So um, let me vi phi.cp. All right, so here is an example C++ application that's almost entirely meaningless. So what we're doing is we're getting the number of processes, or in this case, uh, Xeon Phi will get us the number of hardware threads because there's 60 processes and each supports four hardware threads. So we're gonna get that amount. And then uh, notice what I'm doing. I'm leveraging OpenMP uh, to uh, do a sum in parallel. So on each of these processes, I'm incrementing this, this one variable and doing a kind of a reduction. I know it's meaningless to leverage powerful technology like this, but anyways, that's what we're going to work with. So um, let me exit from here, and then uh, I'll show you how to how this whole gets compiled. So uh, I'm going to use the I'm obviously required to use the Intel compiler. I need the switch MMIC. Uh, MIC is an abbreviation for many integrated cores. That's kind of like the the key name for uh, the Intel Xeon Phi technology. Then I want uh, C++0x here. I also want OpenMP and uh, the, the file itself, so phi.cpp. Let's try compiling this. Wait a second, yeah, module, load Intel. Try this again. Hooray, so, um, uh, so I've got a dot out which is an application designed specifically for the Xeon Phi. I don't think I can run this here because it's compiled for a device. See, I get a, an error, I cannot execute binary file. What I can do is I can send it off to the to one of the Xeon Phi. So I can say SCP uh, a.out and I send it to MIG0. There's two devices here, MIG0 and MIG1. I set it to uh, uh, MIG0. Um, 
hopefully that's uh, that's been done. Please ignore all the weird error messages. This happens sometimes. But anyways, uh, let's try SSHing to the device and actually running it there. Uh, a dot out. Oh, that's that's another issue. I have to specify the libraries and where to find the libraries. So the library path equals dot and then a dot out again. All right. So I know it doesn't look like much. We've just executed uh, code on two. 240 threads inside a Xeon Phi, I, and we're looking at this this black and white console. But uh, this is just a taste of what it's really like to program this thing. Obviously, there's uh, uh, depending on the mode of interaction you choose and so on. There are different uh, different issues and different levels of complexity and so on. But it is something that you can plug into your machine to make it more powerful, and it is something you can compile things like Boost for, which is you know, key to the whole thing. That that's what I want to have basically. So uh, jumping back to uh, jumping back to our presentation, um, essentially, uh, yes, as I said, it's 60 processes, four hardware threads per core. So that's what we got the 240 from. It's got eight gigs of memory. So uh, that's a constraint, uh, I guess, because uh, there is nowhere to swap to. That's still a problem even here. It's got a five 512 bit SIMD register. So in case you're doing computation. Uh, you're getting this massive SIM register as well that you can also leverage. Uh, but for me, the key thing is that you can branch, you can put conditional logic, you can run different things on different processes. So, um, and, and and another important thing is that this uh, this device, these devices, they support uh, programming models which are similar to what you have in ordinary PC. So you can do things like, you know, leverage OpenMP or use MPI or you know explicit threading if you want to. Uh, Intel is working on uh, other models as well. I think OpenCL is supported already, so uh, there is no problem in this regard. So it's it's another fantastic device. And once again, I will stress the fact that you can be using both the CPU and and, and both of you are Xeon Pi's at the same time. And obviously, if you have a cluster, then you can be using, or in my case, you can be using, uh, I don't know, 24 Tesla Ms and 24 Xeon Pi's at the same time if you, if you need this kind of power to compute something. So next up, we come to the most obscure technology of all, the FPGA. So uh, FPGA actually stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. And this is probably, as a technology, this is the closest you're going to get to designing your own CPUs or designing your own custom chips, as opposed to using something that's uh, provided for you. So uh, for those of you who are maybe not too aware of uh, computer architectures, the CPUs that we have on desktop machines and, you know, smartphones and whatever, they're very general purpose. You feed them instructions, they will do anything for you. On the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, things called ASICs. And ASICs are essentially chips which are hard-coded to do one thing and one thing only. That's it. And uh, that's what that's what's being used for Bitcoin mining right now because all the other technologies are considered not powerful enough anymore. So FPGAs are the middle ground between uh, something that's hardwired and something that's very flexible. They're kind of like hardware emulators. So they're certainly slower than ASICs, but they can be faster than uh, ordinary CPUs in certain scenarios. I'm not saying they're uh, great for uh, everything. Uh, one of the key things is that these these are typically programmed using hardware description languages such as VHDO and Verilog. There are other approaches to this, uh, like using System C or, as I mentioned, OpenCL. There are a couple of higher level solutions. So, for example, I use MATLAB and I've recently been investigating ways of. Uh, uh, well, MATLAB has this thing called HDL coder where you write something in MATLAB and it kind of converts it into HDL. Unfortunately, that conversion doesn't please me so much. Another approach is Embedder, which is actually built on our technology, JetBrains MPS. That's uh, that's a way of uh, basically generating uh, things like state machines and other things from higher level constructs. So check it out if you're interested in in this sorts of uh, things. So the question of, the question is why FPGAs? Well, an FPGA basically gives you a huge array of logic gates, and you can do anything you want with them. You can reconfigure them in in any in any kind of way. And so the end result is that you can end up with something that's so intrinsically parallel that it beats everything out of the water because effectively you've designed your own CPU specifically for a task of, I don't know, for a task of handling data from the stock market, for example. So you have something on the 
coming in on the, the TCP IP stream and you parse it and you very quickly, faster than your competition, you rip out the data, you can even perform some calculations. Another key thing is that FPGAs are generally, uh, they don't draw so much power. Another key thing that I like is that they have much better scale scalability. So for example, you can, you can go off and buy a board which has like 20 FPGAs on it. You cannot go off and buy a board which has 20 Xeons on it, or at least uh, for an uh, affordable amount of money. But the key thing about FPGAs is they're not a commercial off-the-shelf solution. You can't just go into your PC world and, and pick up an FPGA card because it's so extremely specialized and because programming it is... Um, is very difficult and very costly. I would I would actually estimate that the uh, uh, the actual uh, if you want to compare it to ordinary software development, I would say the time taking to uh, program an FPGA device for a particular task is 10 to 100 times slower. So that's something to keep in mind if you want to. Uh, if you want to uh, leverage this technology, there is a question here uh, from Orlando. Is is my domain? Is your domain currently? Is the domain you currently work? Which hardware alternative do you recommend using? Well, actually, I recommend using everything. It, every every one of these devices has uh, has a particular use, and you know it it really depends on on what you're doing. In quant finance, there's certainly scope for leveraging everything, basically, and uh, it's just you know, courses for courses kind of thing. So if you have some data power computation that's taking a long time, you can send it off to the GPUs, especially if it's single point, uh, you know, single precision. You can you can just fire it off across a cluster and all your Teslas will, will munch it and whatever. If you're, if you're trying very complicated logic, like for example, let's suppose you're simulating card games in a Monte Carlo setting. In that way, you would use a Xeon Pi. It works fantastically. It, it can branch. <laughs> for a change, it can leverage. You know, you can you can write ordinary C++. You can use Boost and whatever. So that's great. Uh, if you need uh, very fast responses on, on a hosted solution when you are, for example, getting data from the markets and you need to do something to them in like microsecond time almost, you, you're going to be looking at FPGAs. Uh, quite often there are, you know, custom custom boards for uh, the the Ethernet interface. The, sometimes it's programmable. You can also program the actual interface. So um, the, um, and, you know, it, it really depends on, on what you're actually doing. So uh, what is the FPGA for? Once again, the idea is exactly the same. You're offloading some tasks from the CPU, but an alternative is that uh, there is no CPU, that uh, an FPGA has an Ethernet port in it, you plug in the cable, and everything happens on the FPGA. And something entirely different happens on the CPU. That's also a possibility. Or you have infrequent interactions. Yeah, the, there are, you know, it's uh, the sky is the limit as far as implementations go. Um, FPGAs are, of course, a lot less flexible. They're not so good at for math, particularly because, uh, well, there is no, uh, typically there is no specially designed, you know, math coprocessor or anything. So you, you'll end up implementing uh, fixed point logic yourself, which uh, isn't always what you want. But for fixed uh, fixed size uh, data, for example, fixed point data, it's it, it's totally uh, it's totally the right solution. It is, however, a low level construct and uh, FPGAs, if you factor in the cost of development and production, they're, they're fairly, relatively expensive. I mean, they don't draw much power, okay, but the whole process of getting them into a uh, getting them into a state where you can, you know, start leveraging and you know, start making money off of those FPGAs, uh, that's uh, that's quite far away from just just buying a device and thinking that it works. There is an additional duality, I guess, in the fact that first of all, you have to buy the development boards, and then you have to either produce the actual cards yourself or have somebody produce the cards for you. And typically, if you buy uh, third-party cards, they're already, uh, you know, they would be in a particular configuration, so uh, you would have to adapt to that. There, there is uh, lots of stuff uh, to cover. So um, FPGAs, I wouldn't say they, they directly compete with ordinary CPUs. Typically, they, they try to uh, take a chunk of the market by, by so solving a, a fixed number of tasks. Uh, and their advantage is due to the highly asynchronous nature, the fact that during a single clock cycle, the FPGA will do what you told it to do. You have a massive, huge array of gates. They can do uh, several calculations at the same time. Uh, they can spread data across the across the chip. It's it's really 
totally different to what we're used to in this this kind of instruction processing mindset. Um, so the goal is fairly simple. You have to pre-program an FPGA to uh, uh, to solve a particular problem set very quickly, and that's it. So uh, an example would be something like protocol parsing in hardware. And yes, uh, there is a fair comment here that I'm talking a lot about FPGAs, and uh, it's unclear what this has to do with C++ programming. Well, in actual fact, uh, you can program FPGAs using OpenCL, as I said, and I, I sort of lump C and C++ into the same bucket, shall we say. But uh, the key thing here is to uh, the key thing is to talk about computation, about the technologies that's uh, available for speeding up computation. So yeah, I mean, in the same regard, you could say that CUDA isn't really C++ because you know you can use the uh, C interface. But uh, uh, there are C++ approaches to all of these. And in fact, one of the key things about C++ as a language is that uh, when you have a new device come out, what language do you think the device manufacturer supports first? Well, uh, I bet that in in the vast majority of cases, as we can see from uh, GPUs and uh, from Xeon Phi, the first language to be supported is C++. So uh, I think I've, uh, I've made it within the scope of a single hour, which is great. Let me uh, let me try and go going through the uh, uh, going through the questions. I think I've I've actually addressed most of them. There is a comment here about uh, an FPGA kit for Raspberry Pi. I haven't heard about that. I actually use Altera. Altera's FPGAs, so um, uh, things like Cyclone and Aria and so on. But but I guess the in in the FPGA space we only have uh, two major manufacturers. We have Altera and Xilinx. There are a few smaller ones as well. But if you're looking if you're looking for a uh, sort of ready-made solution, I can actually try and uh, well maybe maybe not right now. But uh, if you're looking for uh, somebody to build you FPGA cards, they're likely to be using either Altera or Xilinx. But uh, uh, can, I, can I elaborate on the protocol parsing? Yes, indeed. So um, I guess one of the things I did not mention is the fact that in addition to being able to uh, program FPGAs using a uh, very low level constructs, hardware de de definition languages, it's also possible to uh, grab existing uh, kind of almost like microprocessor implementations and put them right on the FPGA chip. So for example, you can get the implementation of like the TCP IP stack and you can stick it right on your FPGA. So uh, in terms of protocol parsing, why is this whole thing happening? Well, the reason is that um, if, you, if you consider a typical uh, financial market, what's happening is uh, not only do you get the data about the deals that happen on the market, you get the data about every single order that happens on the market, and with with a huge number of participants, everybody's you know putting in orders, they're canceling orders, orders are being folded into deals all the time, and you want to somehow track it. And unfortunately, conventional uh, conventional hardware uh, doesn't do it as well as uh, as you'd like. Or well, I would say this. In part, it's come to a competition of technology as well as uh, you know skill in the sense that people are simply finding uh, ways of doing this like a few microseconds faster than the competition because I mean if you if you build your order book uh, a few microseconds faster then you have the the right information a bit faster and so you can jump in an arbitrage opportunity and actually make some money so I guess one of the reasons why why uh, custom feed handlers that's the that's the term for a protocol parser it's a feed handler uh, one of the reasons why these things exist and why people actually sell them you know commercial solutions in this space is because we're we're engaged in a war so instead of buying tanks we're buying FPGA based feed handlers we're buying um, network interface cards that are faster that are programmable that have different uh, you know more sophisticated interfaces uh, than ordinary consumer uh, cards and so on and so forth and basically that's what this whole talk has been about uh, is uh, me me discuss discussing the uh, the methods of war shall we say or at least in in this industry of course that's not that's not all that you should be uh, using it for but uh, you know, most mostly, actually, to be fair, I mean, uh, this is this is my final slide. I wanted to mention that uh, I wanted to mention that uh, at JetBrains uh, we're working on both a separate IDE and C++ support for eShopper, which both of these I haven't really shown 
in part because they're still in the works. But uh, the key thing about uh, what we're doing is that we're uh, we're generally targeting the general market, shall we say, the uh, commercial of the shelf PC users. So, uh, and I wanted to sort of uncover the, the more complicated uh, side of the world. But of course, the, the key thing about uh, all these custom technologies that I mentioned is they're only applicable to a tiny proportion of the population because ultimately most people don't need them. Most people don't need to, uh, I mean the only, the only technology out of those I mentioned that gained any proliferation at all is the GPUs. Um, ah, there's a question here. Uh, so, ta -da, ta -da. Okay, that, that that's a very long question about uh, streaming sim the extensions, and I'm not sure off off the top of my head, I, I'm not sure I could answer it. The key thing about SSD, and the question here is uh, to the tune of uh, what performance benefits would would one gain from uh, using SIMD in a particular setting? Uh, the answer is not uh, is not so clear because sometimes when you jump from uh, like I said, I like to mix OpenMP and SSE. So sometimes when you uh, mix uh, uh, mix the two, you don't get as much. Uh, you don't get a linear performance growth, and that's something that you know uh, is worth. Uh, it, it needs to be investigated because there is no uh, there is no assumption that you know once you're using SSE, you're getting. Uh, uh, you getting you know quad the performance or eight times the performance. It really depends on your task. It really depends on the usage patterns, the 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 memory alignments, and so on. It's uh, there are lots and lots of concerns in this regard. So I'm not sure I can uh, I can answer this particular question uh, just like that. Everything requires measurement, and that's why I was saying that you know typically we use two cards per uh, machine, but it does require measurement in the sense that you know if if more cards per machine work for you, then why not? Who am I to stop you? So uh, I think we're done with the questions. So uh, I, I'd like to thank everyone for. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Can you recommend to use another? So the question is, uh, uh, what? I think the, what you mean to say is, would you recommend to use Intel Xeon 5 for complex simulations like a car simulator? Uh, I imagine yes. Why not? I mean, if you think about it, you're getting uh, 60 processors that can do, you know, entirely separate things. They can each uh, each do their own thing. And so, for if you have a problem that scales to 60 or scales beyond 60 at least, although as I said, there is four hardware threads per core, so that's 240. If you have a problem that scales beyond that, then you can leverage the parallels. Man, and I mean, totally. Go ahead and leverage it, but you know it. It really uh, it has to bear comparison with the speed of the actual cores and so on. And unlike GPUs, I don't think uh, I don't think Amazon offers uh, Xeon Phi's to play around with. Although on the other hand, um, when I was when I didn't have any devices of my own, I uh, Intel actually gave me a virtual machine to play around with. So you can, I mean, I think for uh, for both CUDA and for uh, the Xeon Phi's, you can basically, if you ask nicely the companies that sell those devices, they'll give you a virtual machine to investigate. And that's what I think you should do. So if you have a car, uh, a car simulator or some other complex simulation, then ask to uh, use a virtual machine and, and port your code over. See, see if you're getting any performance benefits, and if you are, well, you can you can consider buying such a device. They're not exactly cheap, though, but they're not uh, they're not terribly expensive either. So uh, it's uh, it's not you know it won't put you through the roof. So um, I guess we're done at this point. Thanks everyone for joining. If you if you have any other questions after this talk, then uh, feel free to tweet or email or contact us however you want. Uh, we're going to put the the recording and the slides up at some point, so you can you can look at those. And uh, best of luck with your uh, high performance development practices. Take care. Bye bye.